G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews and a review of the Hobby King FPV ground station. And I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to work out that this is not the Hobby King FPV ground station. This is my FPV pole and look, it's a mess, it's a shambles. It's a complete dog's breakfast. I've got my four channel diversity controller up here. I've got a couple of receivers here. Um, and oh, what have I got there? I don't know, a bit of power conditioning there. Um, and there's cables and wires, obviously balance lead adapters, JST connectors, there's AV leads, and, and there's, there's Velcro everywhere for hang, hanging batteries off. This kind of thing gives the hobby a bad name. <laughs> this is really a mess, and it's just grown from, you know, what was a simple idea through to a collection of bits that are really a nightmare to maintain and just make sure everything's working. And that's where the Hobby King FPV base station promises to make life a whole lot simpler. And here it is. Well, here it is and, and a few other bits as well, actually, because the FPV ground station is actually really just this big grey box here. I'll do a bit of a 360 for you so you can see. Um, you don't get the receivers. I've got a couple of Equanum auto scan receivers here. You don't get the monitor. The, this is a 10 inch monitor. And uh, all you really get is this grey box and the power leads and the video leads. and that's it. You can of course buy all the other extras, but okay, what is this box doing? Well, it's doing all the stuff my pole was doing, but it's doing it a whole lot neater. What we've got here in effect is a battery. Inside here, we can, as you can see, I've got the battery here. Um, I've got a Zippy 4000 milliampere hour battery, four cell, it requires a four cell battery up to about 5000 milliampere hours. That plugs into an XT60, excuse all these extra wires here, I'll just unplug this for a moment because it's in the way, I'll talk about that later. Uh, we have an XT60 connector which plugs the battery into the box. There's also a balance lead connector because this little LCD here keeps a track of your battery voltage. So you don't end up suddenly finding that, oh, well, my battery's gone dead and everything has stopped working. So I plug that in. You can see we've got an LCD display here. It displays, I don't know what that reading is actually. Um, it displays each cell in series, so 3.8, 3.79, 3.79, 3 and 3.79. And then it gives you a total volt pack, 15.19 volts. There you go, and you can set an alarm on there so that when your, if your main LiPo here starts to drop too low, it'll beep and warn you time to land or you're going to lose everything. And you would lose everything because unlike my FPV pole, which has a battery for the receivers and a battery for the diversity controller and a battery for this, that and the other, this one battery does all. It does that because inside here, there is a series of voltage regulators which provide multiple outputs and not just 12 volts. Let's spin it around so you can see that interesting side of the whole kit and caboodle. I'll move this out of the way. Now, let's, uh, let's just tighten up a bit on this and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Just readjust my little tripod, excuse the bumpy. Oh, look at that, see? Um, okay, so we've got a five volt output with a bayonet connector. We've got a USB five volt output We've got a power switch and we've got four 12 volt outputs with bayonet connectors. Now, you might be thinking, why would you want a USB output? Well, I'll tell you, that's actually really handy. One of the best features of this thing is the number of times <laughs> I've rolled up to do some flying and I've found that my Mobius or my Run Cam or my Legend is flat. My high definition recording camera is flat. The battery in it just flat. It really annoys me. And uh, I don't have a five volt USB jack in my car. So this is great. I can just plug my, um, HD recording cam in here and charge it up while I'm at the field. Brilliant. So if you forget to charge your camera the night before, all is not lost. There is an output. That could also be used to charge your smartphone because a lot of stuff these days, a lot of the cameras are Wi-Fi and if you want to make changes to settings and things, you could have your smartphone there. And if your smartphone goes flat, well, you're stuffed. But hey, you can charge it up through this jack. They should have two of these. I'm going to talk about what they should have done with this base station after the review. But they've got a 5 volt jack. That's fine. And so they've got four of these jacks here. You can run a couple of receivers. You can run a the LCD display, you can run uh, your goggles, you can run a DVR, well you can't run them all together, there's only four outputs right, I'll talk about that again and I'll talk about that a bit more later on too. Now the way on the other side here you'll see we've got a whole lot of other stuff and here's where all the diversity and other stuff comes in, oh, turn it around, you notice I don't have a tripod for it, I've only got a tripod for my camera so I have to put this on a little box so you can see it. Okay we've got two RSSI inputs and those come from your two receivers. We've got two video inputs because they come from your two receivers as well. Very important that you make sure you get this and this going to the one receiver and that and that. If you cross over two of the leads, then it's going to work exactly the wrong way. So you really should perhaps even just number these leads so you know. In fact, it would have been nice if they were numbered out of the box, but they're not. Anyway, so your video signal comes in here 
your RSSI signal from your receivers is used to determine which of these inputs gets buffered and put through to these three output jacks here. Now these are RCA connectors. You can have one for your LCD monitor, one for your goggles, one for your DVR. So it's quite good to have the three outputs. It gives you the ability to plug plenty of devices in. Although most FPV receivers have a couple of video outputs, that's often not enough. This three is a good number. That's really good. I'm happy with that. Now if we spin around a bit further, we can see the other side of it. And this is where there's a couple of little... Um, let's just, I'll just go down a bit so you can see what I'm talking about. A couple of little carriers here, little holders for your receivers. And it's designed pretty much for the quantum auto scan receivers. They just slot in there quite nicely. There you go. So you've got two receivers with your diversity. And of course you can put different antennas on. This has obviously got, in this case, a patch and a skew planar wheel. But I've spoken about all the good things, the good aspects of this. Included in that is the quality of construction inside this box. Uh, it's quite nicely engineered. There are some really well designed and laid out electronics, with the exception of some stuff like using a cable tie to hold a heatsink on, which I'm not that impressed with. But uh, basically speaking, this box looks like it's pretty well engineered. No problems there. And it is certainly going to tidy up those horrible scruffy cables that you saw on my FPV pole. But I think Hobby King have really just missed the missed the target a little bit with this thing because they've only gone halfway. Um, I think this is just under 100 bucks, 100 bucks retail, which means, you know, it's it's not uber cheap. I mean, a length of PVC pole and some Velcro is pretty cheap and twisting some wires together is pretty cheap. But this is a little bit more expensive and I would rather have paid 120 bucks and got some of the things I'm going to tell you about now. Some of the things I think they should have included in this product. Well, for a start, as I said, we've got four 12 volt outputs. It's not enough. It's not enough. If you want to run two receivers, a DVR, an LCD display, oh, there's nowhere to plug your goggles in. Okay, so it'd be nice to run your goggles from this unit there. So they're a bit short. In fact, you know, considering that these bayonet connectors are probably 30 cents each, they could have put five in here, you know, and or six, seven even. There's plenty of room in the case. They could have put enough in there to be really, really useful. If you're going to have a, like a power bank set up, you want to be able to feed as many devices as possible. The other thing is, it's only one USB output. Now, if you've got a smartphone and a Mobius and a, and a whatever, you might want to charge more than one of those at once. Certainly I would. I want to charge, I've got a three, I take three HD recording cameras when I go out and I'd like to be able to charge them all at once if I could. So what's wrong with putting three USB power outputs there? And then there's room for it and it would be so much more useful. Perhaps even replace that five volt bayonet because I don't have anything that uses a five volt output with a bayonet connector. So mm, there you go. So they should have really manned up on these outputs here, really improved the power output side of things. If you're going to have a power box, let it have a whole lot of outputs and more than you need, not one less than you need. All right, let's spin around to the other side with the video. Ka-ching, here we go. Now on this side, what I think they should have done is they've got two inputs. Now, as you saw on my poll, I've got a four channel diversity controller. It's really simple. It takes only a tiny handful, perhaps 30 cents more components to do a four channel controller than it does to do a two channel one. So why didn't they make a four channel one? Uh, okay, nine out of 10 pro people probably won't use a four channel one, but for an extra 50 cents, they could have pleased the, the remaining people who really wanted to have more than four, more than two receivers. That would have been nice. The other thing I notice here is now increasingly a lot of people are using audio on their FPV feed. They listen to the audio from the aircraft because that can give you some really useful information when your plane is beyond visual line of sight and there's something not quite right. You can hear if there's a vibration or if, the, if you know something's wrong. You can actually, even when you're flying FPV thermal soaring, the wind noise is a great indicator of your airspeed. So it's nice if you can hear the the wind noise increase as you pick up speed and drop off so you can tell when you're getting near the stall because it all goes quiet but you need to switch audio if you're using diversity to do that and there's no it only switches video why not switch the audio as well uh, because well, we, we have these inputs but we only have video coming out there's enough of these but there should also be audio jack as well so that we can listen to the model because a lot of fpv transmitters have the microphone built into them and a lot of people like that really small thing wouldn't cost much to do that would greatly enhance the value of this to you know quite a number of people now the other thing if we look around here these little receiver holder things here i mean I, this is a great idea but i mean they're a bit but how you going they're a bit wibbly wobbly with the thing in there and the, the real problem this is the real problem look <laughs> look at those antennas if you're going to use a patch um i'll just move this screen out of the way if you're going to use a patch then it's right beside your skew planar wheel and this this you know one finger width of gap 
So your diversity is not going to be that flash hot, certainly from the point of view of multi-pathing. And multi-pathing is one of the main reasons to use diversity. Because basically the same wave front is going to be hitting both antennas at the same time. So, you know, if you're multi-pathing, you're still going to get the nulling out of the signal that it causes when you get an antiphase uh, signal hitting those antennas, such as caused by the Fresnel zone, violating the Fresnel zone. So, really, one of the reasons I use an FPV pole is because you also you don't want your receivers down here on the ground. As I indicated in my video on the F zone, you want your receivers as high as possible to get them out of, the, to, to move that a Fresnel zone as far away as possible, so you're least likely to violate it. And that means getting some height on both ends. If you can't get height at the model end, you really want to get height at the receiver end. So what I would have liked to have seen Hobby King do with this, I mean, it's pretty simple. If, I was, if I'd been designing this base station, I would have made this little bracket here designed to go onto a piece of 25 millimeter PVC piping. So I'd have had the, the, the be slightly wider, so the receivers were spaced further apart, and there would have been a, a thing that just slotted onto the top of a PVC pipe. So I could take this bit and I could take these two receivers, mount them on top of the pole that I've already got, way up high, and I would have provided some three meter cables for the RSSI and the video and the power. That way my receivers are way out of the way, up on top of a pole, where they get a really good clean signal without problems with the Fresnel zone being violated. The audio and the uh, RSSI come down to this box where, the, where it's switched. Um, and we don't have the silly situation because if we turn this around a bit further, you can see how, how crazy it is. Um, we've got the, I've got a 10 inch LCD screen there. Firstly, it blocks the signal to the, to the patch antenna. It's completely in the way if you do that. Um, and even more so, if you try and turn the, the 10 inch screen, which you can probably see here, it, the, the aerials are in the way, the receivers are in the way. Now, one of the nice things about having a FPV base station or ground station is that you can put a lovely big screen on there which means other people can see what you're seeing through your video glasses. The system will only support a seven inch screen or smaller because otherwise it just bangs into these receivers on the side and, and you, it blocks the signal and it means you can't actually even rotate the screen properly. So a bit of a faux pas if they'd relocated these receivers to the top of the pole, excellent. They would have been fine, but they didn't. So, you know, you could do it yourself, but then you still have to go out and buy yourself some cables, some long cables for your RSSI and your video feed and should be for your audio as well. Now the other thing I found, Hobby King provided this unit, I disclosed this was provided for review, um, and they also provided this monitor. They said, do you need a monitor? I said, yes, why don't you send me one that you'd like me to show people? So I, they sent me this FieldView 1010 monitor, 10 inch monitor, very nice monitor, nice and crisp and very sharp and bright. Uh, the only thing I don't like is the glary screen. It's got, um, has it got a glary screen? Yes, even with, is that, yeah, even with the plastic protection film peeled, peeled off, it's got a shiny screen. I hate shiny screens because a matte screen is just much more tolerant of high ambient lighting. Never mind. Other than that, it's a really good screen. But the problem is, the problem is it came with, this is the cables that come out of the screen. It comes with these RCA female connectors. You think, oh, well, that's not a problem, is it? Well, yeah, it is actually. Because um, although the base station itself comes with a squillion different cables, and I counted, well, it's not quite a squillion. It's too short of a squillion cables that comes with it. They don't include an RCA male to RCA male connector. So, in fact, the only video connectors they provide are RCA to 3.5, RCA to uh, 2.5 millimeter jack plug. So there's no way to connect this monitor to this video output. I had to go out into the back room here and find a crusty old male to male connector here, which was one that I had from an old DVD player, in order to be able to plug this in, plug the monitor into the base station, like that. So it didn't even come with the cables I needed to actually make it work with an external, neither the LCD nor the base station came with the right cables. That's a little tiny thing, but you know, it'd be nice if there was matching cables, a little small thing. So there you go. Um, now there's one other feature I'd really like to see on a base station like this, and that is OSD. Now sure, we've got OSD in our models, we've got OSD on the flight controller, or, you know, OSDs in our FPV models so we can see the battery voltage of the, of the model, we can see GPS coordinates, artificial horizon, all sorts of really cool stuff. But Sometimes there's other information you want to know about what's going on back on Earth on your base station. Things like, what is the battery voltage in here at the moment? Well, you're wearing goggles. You cannot see this little LCD display on the end here because you've got your goggles on. And you don't want to have to take your goggles off to read that voltage. Sure, there's an alarm, but it would be nice to know if you're heading away on a, on a, on a long flight that you had enough reserve capacity here just by looking at the voltage to 
carry on to your destination or stay up as long as you like and then get back again. So wouldn't it be great if there was a button you could push and it overlaid this voltage onto the video stream because remember the video is passing through this unit, it's coming in here, it's coming out there. So you can overlay anything you like inside. Overlay the voltage of the base station battery. Even better, and this is really useful too, is why not overlay the RSSI figure? Because let's face it, if you've got a high gain antenna like a patch or a helical and you want to fly down the beam, then you need to know how strong a video signal your base station is receiving. Because if you start drifting off the edge of the beam, then the picture gets a bit grainy. Um, you need to know which way to go to come back. You can zigzag a bit, but you always run the risk of actually dropping right out of the signal. If it tells you what the RSSI signal is, then you can make sure that you're flying on the peak of the RSSI all the way right down the middle of the beam and get maximum distance from the amount of power you've got available to you on your FPV system. That'd be a great feature. Also, it'd be nice if it just told you which of these receivers was active. There's no light, there's no indicator as to which receiver is actually um, working or delivering the signal to this output jack when the system's running. If there was just a little indicator that overlaid onto the OSD, you could see. And it would give you some clues if you were flying a long way away and suddenly the signal switched from your directional antenna to your non-directional, then you've flown out of the beam. If you're just without any kind of indicator as to which receiver is working, you won't know why suddenly it just got a bit snowier. And so these are little bits of information. And as I say, it'd be another 20 bucks to put, less than 20 bucks to put an OSD in the space station. And all these improvements I'm suggesting would turn this perfectly good, perfectly serviceable, perfectly functional base station into an outstanding bit of kit that I would buy. I'd fork out, fork out my own money for it. Because not only would it be reducing the amount of wiring and all the clutter on your pole, but it's also going to be adding functionality that you don't get any other way. So yeah, I'd really like to see that. Maybe Quantum will bring out a version too. Maybe they'll listen to what I've said in this video. Maybe they'll canvas some of their customers and say, hey, would you really like to have an OSD system that would display some of that critical information from your ground station onto your goggles? Would you like more than four 12 volt outputs? Would you like more than one USB output? All these things, stuff that should have been asked before they rolled this out, in my opinion. You know, they should have actually consulted very closely with people using FPV to get some feedback and said, well, what do you think? Because I would have said all the things I've just said. Doesn't make it a bad product. I mean, as I say, this is going to really declutter your setup. But as I say, if they'd made those little changes, they could have turned a good product into a really fantastic product for another 20 or 30 bucks. Nevertheless, if you have a pole like mine and you want to get rid of all that crap that's hanging off it and make things a whole lot more reliable because it's all nicely, neatly organized, then this isn't a bad deal. It's not a bad deal. Um, I won't be buying one because it doesn't go far enough for me. It doesn't go far enough for me. I'll stick with my pole and I'll probably just put some more tape on it, a bit more Velcro. But if I was starting from scratch, I might buy one of these. But if they bought out one with all those features for 130 bucks, I'd be in like a robber's dog. I'd be buying one as soon as it hit the streets because I'd love something with all that functionality and all that flexibility. So there you go. That's the Hobby King FPV base station. Before I go, I've got to share something with you. This is, <laughs> this is part of the uh, instructions that come with it. Read this very carefully. Look at that. So there you go. If you've got comments, questions, put them in the usual place. I'll do my best to answer them. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Give it a thumbs up if you like this video, because that always helps. And I will now clear my bench, get on and review something else for you. Bye for now.